Okay, starting with 2-6, um, we're solving each of these equations using a method other than the quadratic formula. So hopefully you feel confident when you see a quadratic that you have a few tools in your toolbox. Okay, so um, I'm noticing that this is in standard form. And it's already set equal to zero. Um, I've got that common factor of y. So this one I'm not going to factor. It could be factored. Um, or I'm not going to factor it using the area model, I should say. I'm just going to factor out that common factor of y. y times y is y squared. And y times negative 6 would be negative 6y. And that gives me two terms that when I multiply them, I get 0. So using zero product property, either y is 0 or y minus 6 is 0. So there's one of your solutions. And your other solution would be y equals 6. Those are your x-intercepts. Seven. Um, I'm wondering if this would be easier just to graph. Um, oh, we don't have to graph it. Never mind. Um, so if I subtract 7 from both sides, I'm going to get n squared plus 5n equals 0. And then we can just do the same thing we did over here. Factor out that common factor of n. n times n is n squared, n times 5 is 5n, so my two x-intercepts would be 0 and negative 5. 2t squared. Okay, let's do the same thing here. Um, you could do 2t squared minus 14t equals 0. Subtract 3 from each side and factor out the common factor of 2t. So both the greatest common factor for both of these would be 2t. 2t times t is 2t squared. And 2t times negative 7 would be negative 14t. And if it's set equal to 0, then you know either 2t is 0 or t minus 7 is 0. So either t is 0 or t is 7. And then we have 1 third x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals negative 4. Okay, so 1 third x squared plus 3x, I'm going to add 4 to both sides, equals 0. Um, you could factor out 1 third x, so that would give me 1 third x times x gives me x squared. 1 third times what would give me, 1 third x times what would give me 3x. So 1 third times what gives you 3. 9. 1 third times 9 is 9 over 3, which is 3. Okay, equals 0. So either 1 third x is 0 or x plus 9 is 0. So x equals negative 9 or x equals 0. And I kind of went fast. Oops, that wasn't on the screen totally, but I went a little fast there. You're using zero product property in all of these to find your x-intercepts, and all of them had uh, a common factor in two terms and didn't require the typical factoring process. Okay, 2-7, determine the vertex of each of the following parabolas by averaging the x-intercepts and then write each function in graphing form. Okay, so starting with A, x minus 3, x 
minus 11. Okay, so this is in factored form. So I know my x-intercepts. I'm going to use zero product property. And x minus 3 must be 0. x minus 11 must be 0. So x is 3. x is 11. So those are my two x-intercepts. So if it helps to do a, a little sketch here, let's see, let me do it on this side. Okay, 3, 0, and 11, 0 are your two x-intercepts. So you know your vertex is going to be right in between those two because it's a parabola and it's symmetrical. From 3 to 11 is 8, and half of 8 would be 4. So if I go 4 from this direction or 4 from this direction, I'm going to land at 3 plus 4 is 7, 11 minus 4 is 7. So the x-coordinate of my vertex must be 7. I'm just going to substitute 7 into the place of x and solve for y. So that's going to give me 7 minus 3, 7 minus 11. So that's going to be 4 times negative 4, negative 16. So then my vertex is at 7, negative 16. Okay, and maybe, yeah, just go ahead and add that sketch on there. We can do a little sketch for each of these. Also, please um, try to use those directions for uploading your work uh, that are on the main classroom page. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but your, your iPhone has... Um, has a scanning feature. If you just click the camera function, I'm in the notes app. And if I clip, click uh, the camera, it gives me an op option to scan. And then I can just, let's say I'm gonna scan multiple pages. I'm just gonna click, I'm, I'm putting the, the phone where I can see the page and it'll say, it'll give you the option to kind of fix the picture and make it look a little bit better. Um, and then you can do a retake or keep scanning. Let's say I want to keep scanning. And it'll give me the chance to do another one. I would click, I didn't do it, but you could do another one and click save. And then you can share that with the share button. And your Schoology app will pop up on here. Let's see, I have the Schoology app. So it's probably, gonna, there it is, copy to Schoology. And then you would just have to, um, when you click Submit, I think you have to find my class and find the assignment. And then you just share it or submit it. So I'm not going to do it because I don't have the assignment on there, but please try and give that a try. I know with a, a different phone, it might be a different process, but it's kind of, it's very similar and it's just the, the get any scanner app and that will work. Okay, so we're on 27B. Um, we have y equals x plus 2 and then x minus 6. So I don't know how you're feeling about quadratics. I don't know where everybody stands. But um, the reason I'm doing videos and not con is I want to make sure you feel comfortable with um, factoring pretty much all aspects of quadratics, um, completing the square quadratic formula. So I'm hoping that you feel um, better about doing them by the time we get to the next chapter. Um, so if I substitute 0 for y, I'm going to just skip over the whole writing out the equations. I know my x are negative 2 and positive 6. And halfway between negative 2 and positive 6, that's a distance of 8. 
So halfway would be 4 from this direction or 4 from this direction, which would put me at positive 2. So I know my vertex is going to be at positive 2 for the x-coordinate. So I'm going to do plug in 2. So 4 times negative 4 is negative 16. Oh, that's the same thing. Making sure I did that right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that vertex would be 2, negative 16. And then part C. Okay. So here we do have to factor it. The first two were in factored form, but this one is not. So opposite, your x squared and your constant go in opposite corners. You don't have to use the diamond. It's up to you. Multiply these to get your top of your diamond, and the x term is the bottom of your diamond. So you're looking for factors of 40 that add to negative 14. Well, that's going to be 4 and 10, right? But you want them to add to negative, so negative 4 and negative 10. Okay, so that's going to give you x minus 4 and x minus 10 for your factors. So your x-intercepts are going to be positive 4 and positive 10. Okay, Doo -doo -doo. I guess I'm not really sketching the parabola. Um, and then halfway would be, so that's a distance of 6. So half of 6 is 3, so 4 plus 3 would be 7. So my vertex is going to be at 7. So f of 7 is 7 minus 4, which is 3, and 7 minus 10, which is negative 3. So that's going to be negative 9. So my vertex is at 7, negative 9. Okay, and then the last one is in the form that we are using right now. Um, I think your book calls it locator form. I don't know. I call it vertex form, but I'll stick with whatever the book says. Um, so I know my vertex just looking at this, right? I know my vertex is going to be whatever H and K are when I see it in vertex or locator form. So H is positive 2 and K is negative 1 because my vertex form is going to be written X minus H and plus X minus H squared plus K. So if this says negative 1, that's really plus negative. If it says minus 1, it's really plus negative 1. So 2, negative 1 is my vertex. And then for my x-intercepts, you can just do the same thing. Set y equal to 0 and solve for x. Whoops. Minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to add 1 to both sides. That's going to give me x minus 2 squared equals 1. I'm going to take the square root of each side and be careful. You have two solutions, plus or minus 1 is equal to x minus 2. So then you have x minus 2 equals positive 1, x minus 2 equals negative 1. So that's going to be x equals 3, x equals negative 1 plus 2 would be 1. So my x-intercepts would be 3 and 1, and my vertex would be 2, negative 1. All right, okay, 2, 8. Do you need to average the x-intercepts to write the vertex in part D of 2, 7? How do the coordinates of the vertex relate to the equation in part D? So I think we kind of, I kind of answered this when I was um, talking. Um, I'm trying to figure out what they want here. 
Okay, I was just looking to make sure I don't leave anything out. Um, so what we were saying that the vertex is HK, but it's good to know the reason that that's the vertex. So if I plug in a two, let's do F of two, that's gonna give me two minus two squared minus one, which would give me negative one. So the reason that's the vertex is because two negative one is, or, or the reason that is, yeah, that's the lowest point on your graph. It's the minimum value. So basically, as long as you know that H and K are your vertex, um, and you remember that this form is X minus H and plus K, you're gonna be able to pick out your vertex pretty easily. Um, two, nine. Looks like we've got some trig. Do you remember all of your trig ratios? We're going to solve for x in each of these. So I do expect you to draw diagrams. All right. Let's see. I uh, should have done this on a different page, make it easier to grade it. Oh, well. Um, so 2-9a. What do we have on? 15 degree angle. And I believe there are some math notes in this lesson reminding you of all your trig values. Yeah, okay, so if you've forgotten these, remember tangent is your opposite over your adjacent, sine is your opposite over your hypotenuse. These are in lesson. 2.1.1, so you could just go to that lesson. Well, you, if you're looking at that lesson while you're doing the homework, just scroll up a little bit. Sine is your opposite over your hypotenuse, and cosine is your adjacent over your hypotenuse. So use those notes if you need them. And it's good to know them with this notation here. If you're looking at this on the coordinate plane, this would be your x value. This would be your y value, and then h is your hypotenuse. So let's see, what do we have? So I always say draw an arc on the angle and do your sentence stems. I have and I need after you label. So if I label everything, 20 is my hypotenuse. Oh, I forgot to put x on there. X is right here, x is your opposite. So I have my hypotenuse. I need my opposite. So you probably picked up Sokotoa somewhere along the way. So hypotenuse and opposite, that is your sine ratio. So let's do sine 15 degrees and our op we use we use this to figure out what ratio we need. We use the ratio definition to set up our equation. So sine is always the opposite over the hypotenuse. This does not tell you the order that you're writing it in. That just helps you pick whether it's sine, cosine, or tangent. So sine of 15 degrees is x opposite over hypotenuse, x over 20. Cross multiply, so x equals 20 sine 15 degrees. You can leave it like that. I'm pretty sure you know how to type things in a calculator at this point. Um, what do we have? 15 degrees. Although the way it's drawn in the book doesn't really look like 15 degrees, which is a good reminder not to make any assumptions. Okay, so let's label what we have. Draw your arc. This is your hypotenuse, but you don't really need it. You're not looking for it. You don't have it. Let's not even worry about it. This is your opposite. This is your adjacent. Remember, the arc always crosses the hypotenuse and the adjacent. The opposite is the one that's across from your angle. So I have my opposite. I need my adjacent. Opposite and adjacent, that's the first one you started with last year, tangent. So tangent, 15 degrees equals, tangent is always the opposite over the adjacent. 
So it's going to be 5 over x. Whoops, put 1 right there. So x equals, or wait, oh, tangent 15 times x equals 5. And then we're going to divide both sides by tangent 15. And I'm fine with you just leaving it like that. All right, let's see. Make sure I don't. Okay, there we go. Okay, we've got theta and a hypotenuse of 11. Okay, so we're not going to get an answer on this because we don't know the angle, but we can still set up the proportion to solve for it. So if this is the reference angle, then this would be my opposite. 11's my hypotenuse, and if it's across from 90 degrees, that's your hypotenuse, and then 10 is your adjacent. So I have my hypotenuse. Oh, we're finding the angle here, and I have my adjacent. If you're finding the angle, you do I have, I have, hypotenuse and adjacent, that's cosine. So in this case, we're going to do inverse cosine. So you're going to write out inverse cosine of theta equals, and cosine is always adjacent over hypotenuse, so 10 over 11. So I take back what I said. We're going to find the angle on this one, and we can go ahead and do that. So, inverse cosine, and on Desmos, um, that button is there. I can't tell you where it is off the top of my head, but it's there. 10 over 11. Okay, let me make sure that I have my calculator in the right mode. Okay, yeah. So we'll say about 25. So that angle, theta, is approximately 25 degrees. All right. And part D. Okay, so you could use, no, you don't have any angles, you're going to have to use Pythagorean Theorem. Remember this from 8th grade? Okay, so 6 squared plus 12 squared equals x squared. So 36 plus 144 is x squared. So what's that? 170 and 10, so 180 is x squared. And then... Should we review simplifying this? Let's go ahead and do that. So um, when you are simplifying a radical, I'm just trying to remember how much of this we did last year, um, you are going to do a factor tree, factor it into prime numbers, or you, if you know off the top of your head, you know this is a product of some perfect squares. You can just write out those perfect squares. I know 9 is a factor, and it's a perfect square. Um, and then 10 is not. I'm just going to leave 10 the way it is. Okay, so you could go all the way down to prime numbers. I'll do that, and then I'll do it the other way. So if you factor it into prime numbers, you have... And I like to put them in order, 2 times 2 times 3 times 3 times 5. Okay, and then you look for pairs. I could have just left it as um, 2 times 9 times 10, just because 2 is not a perfect square and 10 is not a perfect square. Um, if you do it this way, you wind up with, oh, you know what? I, that would not, I'd still have to go a little bit further with that. Never mind. Um, I forgot about the 4. You have a perfect square factor of 4. So let's do the prime numbers. Um, so square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 9 is 3. 
and you get 6 square root of 5 for your final answer. Sorry if I confused you with this. Um, yeah, if you're doing 10 and 18, you're, you may, may or may not see the 4, um, so maybe it's best just to stick with prime numbers. Okay, um, 2, 10... Um, Ted means to determine the point of intersection of these two lines. So he takes out some graph paper, then he realizes he can do it without graphing. Explain how he's going to accomplish this and find the point of intersection. So you've got two linear equations. If you want the intersection, the first thing you should think about is, let's see, we've got y equals 18x minus 30 and y equals negative 22x plus 50. Are they going to intersect? Well, as long as they don't have the same slope, they're going to intersect. So if I do a little sketch of this in my notebook, this is a y-intercept of negative 30 and a positive, a very steep positive slope. I'm not going to make it perfect. And then this has a y-intercept of 50 and a very steep negative slope. So yes, one's positive, one's negative. They're going to intersect, but even if they were both positive, both negative, they would intersect. Now that may or may not be in the right ballpark, but he could just figure out where they're equal to each other. So set them equal to each other, and you're going to have the x-coordinate for your intersection point. Um, I always get rid of the smaller x when I have x's on both sides, so negative 22 is smaller than positive 18. Add that to both sides. Let's see, that would be uh, 40. And then I'm going to add 30 to both sides, so that would be 80. So then my x-coordinate would be 2, and I could just plug it into either one of these to figure out the y-coordinate. Um, for 211, if 10 to the 3x equals 10 to the x minus 8, Solve for x. Okay. Okay, so we have um, that 10 to the 3x equals 10 to the x minus 8, so that means 3x must be equal to x minus 8. So we've got x's on both sides. Get rid of the smaller one. So 2x equals negative 8, and x equals negative 4. Okay, there's some good math notes for this next problem in lesson. And by the way, all the math notes are, if you scroll down to the bottom of all the chapters on the ebook, there's like a reference section, and it has all the math notes. I think it says student support and it has all the math notes and you can see what they're about because that is one uh, issue with this book. You have some great math notes but you don't always know where they are. Um, so this, these are in lesson one, two, two, if I'm not showing this very well. Um, so range has multiple meanings in math and if you're looking at single variable data Range, all it does is show you the difference between the largest and the smallest number, the max minus the min. Doesn't really come in handy um, when you're describing data. The interquartile range, so the variability or the spread, um, could be described with the interquartile range, and you just subtract the first quartile from the third quartile. So it's the range of the middle half of your data. And if your data is not, if it doesn't have a lot of outliers, then that's a good way to describe it. So um, the remember your five, five point, when you do a box plot, you get the minimum, you get the maximum, you get the median, the middle, and then the first quartile is the average of your two 
middle numbers in that half of the data. And then your third quartile is the average of the two middle numbers here, just because you don't have a middle number, you don't have a median. So the five number summary is your min, your max, your medium, and your two quartiles. And if you subtract those two, you get the interquartile range. Standard deviation, um, I'm not going to read all of this to you, um, but this could also be used to describe your data. And the ebook does have some very nice um, tools for to use here um, when we are when we're actually doing this. Okay, so when vapor under high pressure is released into the air, the resulting noise can severely damage people's hearing. This is a concern for large industrial facilities like power plants and factories. To help control this noise pollution, companies install silencers, which work on the same principles as car mufflers. Hector is an engineer for Vapor Kinetics. Oh, look, Hector's in the book. And he's testing two different models of silencers, the Hush Puppy and the Quiet Down, by measuring the sound energy in decibels. Each silencer is producing at various temp temperatures and pressures. He's taken 30 measurements for each silencer and graphed the two data sets. So he's got the five number summaries here. And we're going to describe the center, the shape, the spread, and the outliers. Okay, so that first set of math notes had range, interquartile range, and standard deviation. Lesson one, two, three has some math notes on the, the spread. Um, so this would be symmetric. You could cut it somewhere and it would just fold right on top of itself. Um, it could be skewed in either direction. This would be skewed left, single peaked, double peaked, and this would just be uniform. So um, spread, you're going to use your standard deviation or your interquartile range to describe your data. And then outliers would be something that just doesn't seem to fit in. Um, and your histogram and your box plot right next to each other are nice because you can see uh, where that median lies. So if we're going to describe, let's see, the center for the hush puppy, the shape, and the spread, um, this one seems to have uh, a skew um, skewed left. And if you look at those math notes that I was just looking at, there's a left skewed um, spread. And then, um, what else? I would just use your, your median. So your median is between, oh, it looks like it's close to 60. Um, here it is, 58.3, and the interquartile range so 70 minus 44.5 to describe the hush puppy. And then for quiet down, I would say that is, um, it's got some outliers over here that don't seem to fit in. Um, left skew and um, the median looks like it's close to 60 also. Um, 54.85 and then what 3.3 minus 37.4 is. Okay, I'm not writing any of this down because I'm showing you the picture. Um, so if you can just write down, this would be left skew and the median and the interquartile range would be good descriptions for both of them. You could write that for both of them. Um, for B, Hector needs to recommend one design. What do you suggest? Well, it's kind of hard to say because um, the median for each one, this one has a median of 58.3, this one's 54.85. Um, if you find that interquartile range, it's, it's, it's almost the same thing. So, um, This one has a median that's 
less, and that's the goal, is that you're the sound, so maybe quiet down would be better. Um, for part C, the decib decibel scale is not linear. Uh-oh, finish. Yeah. Ooh, what did I do? Okay, there we go. Um, the scale is not linear for decibels. So, for example, a 105 decibel sound is eight times louder than a seven, 75 decibel sound. This is roughly the difference in noise between running a kitchen blender and running a chainsaw. So, that might mean that these outliers here are significantly higher in volume than than the values that are down here. So maybe that might change your mind to say that Hush Puppy is a better choice. Okay.